name of the show is The Way to Go. My name is Alan Bendich. I'm going to be your host. Tonight I have an amazing guest. He's, he's a person who's been my best friend since I'm 16 years old. He's, uh, he's like a family member, maybe even closer. Uh, someone who's someone who I, I say I, I, I truly love as a friend. It's, it's Mr. Frank Sinclair. Welcome to the show. Indeed. Thank you for having me. Right. I, I forgot to mention uh, what you, uh, you know, you, so other than being my best friend in the world, uh, you're also the co-executive producer of a movie that we are putting together called Correct. The Laundry Man. And you're the screenwriter of it. Thank you very much. And it's a... It's been a pleasure, actually. It's great. A fun adventure. So, Frankie, where you been? <laughs> yeah, I know it, it has been a while, but uh, through the magic of uh, the internet, the magic of the telephone, right. and uh, what have you, uh, we've managed to maintain contact always, uh, you know, over the years. And uh, you've made a visit out to Arizona more than a couple of times. Yeah. Um, I think I promised the um, commissioner of the New York City Police that I wouldn't be back for a while. So. <laughs> Not through any criminal activity, but <laughs> right. yeah. Well, you are on the other side. You are the you are the policeman, yeah. but. I, I, I met you when, uh, I guess it was just walking in, in Co-op City in the Bronx one day. Correct. And it's about uh, how many years ago? About 44 years ago? Or? Uh, it has to be 44. Right. Yeah, it'll be 44 in May right. of this year. And, and you were always like, I knew you that you would become my best friend even then. I mean, I always looked up to you. You were, uh, you were someone who... Uh, was one of the most talented people I'd ever met, and still still are. I mean, you're a, you're a musician, and uh, you turned me on to some really great music, mm. and uh, you're just a really smart guy, and and you were like the best friend a friend could have. And oh, well, thank you. That's a heck of a compliment. Well, yeah, it's the truth. It's I mean, it's, it's just the way it was. Yeah. But we were. I guess we had some fun when we were teenagers, right? Yeah. Yeah. As a matter of fact, we did a lot of. Uh, uh, running around and doing wild and crazy things. I, I like to call it young and dumb. Yeah. Uh, hopefully most of us tend to grow out of that without any permanent harm, so uh, yeah. whether it be physical, mental, or otherwise. So. But you were always, no matter, I mean, even though you know, Co-op City was this, and still is, like 55,000 people, 15,000 mm -hmm. families, but you were, you, know, you were always a positive person. You were always a positive influence on people around you. You weren't, you weren't the person getting in trouble. You were a person really trying to find your way Mm -hmm. Like the rest of us, but and uh, you were you were you you were someone I could always you you were someone I could always lean on and uh, and you know have no secrets with and how many people could you say that about and you know after all these years I mean really ultimately you know at least for me I, I know that you're the you're the closest person I know and and you know almost everything about me so uh, and what a, what a gift that is that you gave me. And That's I, a gift to me as well because to, to have the uh, confidence from you for you to be able to open up and, and right. because we all need to vent right. uh, at different times and, and even as a young kid because I've always been into reading about stuff like psychology and everything else. Right. I, we, we all need to find our way. I was an awkward kid so uh, having grown up um, in a parochial situation. Right going to private Catholic school and uh, dealing with uh, things when there was uh, actual corporal punishment going on. Right. And the promise of mortal sins taking you straight to hell. Oh I mean, my God. I, I had a lot going on in internally too, you know. So, uh, right. so I, I pretty much uh, pro probably was more of a lame dude with the girls than, than might have seemed from the outside. Well, maybe, but uh, that's not how I remember it. I know. I, I, I remember you being the lead singer and drummer for, you know, playing percussion, and uh, for several bands, and uh, yeah, turning me on to great music. I mean, uh, you, you, you. If it wasn't, I mean, I had a great, te I had a great teenage life because you were my friend, and you know, even when, even beyond that, you know, in my twenties and stuff like that. I mean. I knew, I, I felt at home with you, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, there was nothing we couldn't talk about. We, we had fun. I, mean, I remember when I went to Harper College, you came up to visit me. Um, yeah, several times. Yeah. And there was this guy, Glenn, who I think, uh, this red-haired guy, remember him? Mm -hmm. And we just, yeah, we, we, we used to, even though I didn't know I was going to become an actor, uh, and I didn't know I'd play a hood, um, we, we made believe that I was the, the son, we told this guy who was a freshman. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and at Harper College that I was uh, 
the son of a mobster and From that you were my Don. bodyguard. Yeah. And this guy bought it hook, hook line, line well, yeah, and sinker. Yeah, I mean, right? I played the part. You played the part. I mean, we, uh, you know, hey, <laughs> hey, what are you looking at? What's the matter with you? <laughs> it was crazy. And he bought it, right? But, you know, I mean, we had fun. I mean, Mar you know, we had a whole bunch of, we had a whole bunch of great guys. We had Joey Henson, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Joey Henson was like the greatest guitarist. My lead guitarist, the best of all time. In fact, he was a, a genius in his own right. right. I don't know if you know that. Uh, he had been snatched right from the grip of my band right. by Bell Labs right. because of his genius in electronics. And he actually worked on the original ISDN project. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, and he helped uh, actually institute the internet as well. And in addition, has worked on broadband, and he's still with Bell Labs, right. and he's got about 60 patents to his name. Well, that's great. I mean, I, so. Joey was unbelievable, but he was he was kind of a babe magnet too. I remember, oh, forget him. Uh, I remember. Uh, I mean, besides, I mean, he was he, he was like the he looked like a rock and roll star, and he played guitar like a rock and roll star. Sure did. Uh, but I, I remember we used to we we'd go to Lake Empire in uh, Harper College and oh Lake Empire for those who don't know it is just a if you had a, a college ID and you went to this gate you can go to this pond and basically um, <laughs> you know, there was skinny dipping and all kinds of stuff that was going on over there and I just remember once you know Frankie was there and uh, I was there and Joey and some other Marshall some other guys were all there and Joey Henson is sitting there playing the guitar looking like uh, you know his long hair this yeah. beautiful young boy you know James Taylor Jr. James Taylor Jr. <laughs> And uh, all these beautiful girls are just surrounding him, and he's just playing the guitar. And I'm thinking, God, I wish I knew how to play the guitar. You know, what I mean? it, was like, it was crazy, right? But just picturing Joey Henson naked playing the guitar. <laughs> yeah, but these girls were picking everybody the else was, too, it was yeah. just like, and, But it was just that was the '70s, man. That yeah. was it was a different, and that was. I mean, I don't think Lake Empire exists the same way as it did then. I mean, Probably not. Yeah. yeah, a lot of things were different in the late '60s and, and the early '70s than now. Right? Sure, everything changes, I guess. You know, but I just remember spending so much time just listening to music and hanging out with with the group of people, and really not getting into trouble. Just hanging out. I mean, there were just a bunch of peaceful. Yeah. Really, if you really look at it, I mean, maybe people were upset that we'd hang out on the street corners. But if you have a in Co-op City, if you have fifty-five thousand people, mm -hmm. and such crammed into like this one little area. I mean, and eight thousand kids between eight and eighteen because I did that research back then. There yeah. it is. So That's I mean, what are you going to do? Yeah. I mean, and we we were a bunch of good kids basically. I we mean, were we, the good ones. Yeah. yeah. We didn't. I mean, we we weren't causing trouble. There were there were other groups that were coming into Co-op City at the time, right, and mm -hmm. uh, causing lots of From trouble. From outside. That's yes. what I'm saying. Especially across the uh, the valley. And the valley. Right? Eden across Wald the, high, the highway. Right yeah. across the highway. Mm -hmm. Ninety five. Right. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's crazy. So, I do remember, uh, you know, leaving Co-op City to go to school, and uh, never coming back to Co-op City. That was it. After I went to school, I mean, I, my parents stayed a little bit longer, mm -hmm. but then they moved back to 3127 Nickel Avenue, right, and then your life started in a different direction also. Correct. But uh, throughout it all, especially in the 70s, you know, when I came back and all this stuff, we were still... We still kept in touch. We still hung out. We still, mm -hmm. um, and the the bond probably even got stronger during that time. You know, one thing I, I must say, um, you know, even though there was time and distance, it uh, for some reason every time we got back together, whether it be on the phone or in person, it's as if we took over where we left off. It was so good. It was always, right. and and there was always that understanding too that we'll uh, we'll always be friends. Right, you know? and and that's something that. I mean, it's it, in a way, it's not take, it's taking it for granted, but in a good way. Not oh, yeah. taking it for granted, like when you say I'll take someone for granted, but knowing yeah. that yeah. that <coughs> the feelings still exist. And you've been close to my father. I mean, yeah. and uh, yeah. and he's been a regular on this show. I mean, from you guys is where I learned the expression that uh, of being the mishpucha, <laughs> yeah. you know. And and you know, I, I had since uh, come to find, uh, you know, wow, that was like a, a heavy honor to be bestowed on me to oh, be yeah, considered so. family, basically. Right. You know, it's so like in Italian, you know, because I, I got a, part of my heritage is Italian, right. obviously. Uh, you know, to be considered family is like a huge honor. Yeah, you know, so. well, family is important for. Yeah. Sure. For, for when you love someone that much, that's yeah, it. your well, family, you know. That's it. I mean, it's, it, you know, there's, in a way, there's no words that describe, I mean, words don't do justice to real friends. I mean, I mean, there's no word to say, you know, I mean, 
it, it is. It's, it's just the way it is. It's just like an, it's a force of nature. You know, it's like you can't. It's just the, the way it is. I mean, the things we shared, in terms of experience and uh, experience. I mean, just experience. Yeah. God, sure. the things. I mean, just you know, Yonkers. Everything. Any every, every kind of experiences that you could. Experience. Real to real stereo recording. That's I mean, it. doing uh, multi track uh, stuff. I mean, back before yeah. all the. Uh, I mean, the only time we ever <laughs> went on the back of a motorcycle was yours, and it scared the. The, the, yeah, especially the, the way me. I drove. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> but it was just, it was just a, a great life. And it was a learning experience for me too along the way, you know. And that's how it is. I, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I think it's a good thing. But no, it's I do too. And, thing, and one so. thing about you, though, that I, you know, it, is that you're one of the most creative people I knew. I mean, the, the, your percussion. I mean, mm -hmm. I just remember just, yeah, you know, hanging out with you and, and some of your friends in Manhattan sometimes, and you jam with oh, them. Oh, going down to uh, Central Park at right. uh, Bethesda Fountain. Yeah, yeah that I was mean, always I, back in the late '60s. It was like a mecca yeah. for all the freaks and hippies and just everybody, you know, coming down to have a good time, good old-fashioned fun. Yeah. You didn't worry about getting robbed or anything else. Well, you were the it first person just, I knew yeah. who was a percussionist, and then I found out my cousin Jonathan, Albert's son, right. is also a percussionist. Mm -hmm. And then I met Sheila Escovito, who was the percussionist, and yes, all this stuff. Yes, But uh, you're the person who turned me on to percussion, and even to when I was listening, I never even noticed it until I heard you, until you, you know, you played, and then all of a sudden I noticed it. Just like, you know, like when you're acting, you don't notice that like scenes are really like two minutes that they they piece together you know mm, yeah. it's like once once you hear that wait a second you know, like the you know without the percussion what's the song going to sound like you know it's, sure, it's, sure. it's uh, percussion and rhythm i mean it's that's, that's it. really what drives the uh, the sound especially if you're doing uh, latin percussion right. you know like santana type of stuff where he fused the latin uh, with uh, jazz right. you know and r and b and even. santana was great mm -hmm. and that was one of my early influences but even earlier than that yes was a New York uh, drummer from the Bronx called Ray Barreto, oh, right. who passed uh, several years back. I would follow this cat just about everywhere he played right. in public venues because they used to have the jazz mobile all over the city doing really? free performances. And I'd be literally, I mean, Manhattan, the Bronx, even to Queens right. with uh, the guys from the old neighborhood Manhattan in uh, Morningside Heights. And uh, I learned a great deal just watching him play. And after a while, he got to remember me. You know, I mean, I got I got a little trademark. You know, yeah. so he said, "Hey, man, you're back." I says, "Yeah, you know." And one time he was so sweet. I mean, in between songs and stuff like that and uh, whatnot, he, he did a little jam with me. And I oh, thought, "That's wonderful." Wow, you know, when you're like 15 years old, that's like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> My hands were like going different places. And he's like, he says, "Relax, man. Relax those hands, man." And before you know, we were just having a blast. So yeah, I just wish I had had. Yeah. That kind of musical talent, because the people I met when I was in Hollywood, forget it. I mean, there were opportunities, and but I still had a blast. Yeah. So, so beyond music, you have other talents too. I mean, you're 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 delving into writing now, right? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, that's something that I've always always wanted to do. I know from when I was in sixth grade, um, the nuns noticed, boy, this guy can write because we used to get these uh, SRA reading modules, they call them, right. and it's basically to teach you about reading comprehension. And from those, I learned a great deal about history. I mean, all different types of topics like um, uh, Amelia Earhart right. and uh, the astronauts and this and, and history. And, and I'm into reading. I mean, I'm doing like three of these per class while everybody's struggling to finish one, you know. Right. So I started writing, too, and uh, my essays and everything else. And as a result of that, they sent me to a high school uh, during school time to pick up on writing skills at Rice High School. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like a preparatory high school for seminary. I mean, they, I was kind of heading in that direction, but that's a whole different can of worms. Wow. So they were trying to nurture that. And uh, somewhere in the back of my mind, I've always had this thing about writing. And I've written stories here and there, short stories and uh, stuff. But uh, actually, most of them had, had been tossed in the can, stupidly. Right. I wish now that I had saved some. Uh, when I took a Writing 101 course at uh, Manhattan Community College, the, uh, the instructor was just really taken with this one story about um, the lesson, you know, me as an eight-year-old in Manhattan. 
and, uh, and what comes from uh, taking what's not yours, because my mom used to bribe me to go shopping. And I'll, I'll be quick with this one. No, take your time. Oh, okay, cool. She would bribe me to, to go to the grocery store for uh -huh. her, and uh, in return for this, I could go and get maybe a hamburger and a malted. So, I mean, you know, when you're eight or nine years old, that's super stuff. You're on your own, you right. know, you're doing shopping now, you're a big shot. Right. So uh, I took care of all that, and I'll go next door to the, uh, the campus restaurant on Amsterdam Avenue and 123rd Street. And uh, so I go inside the place, and Mr. Eddie, wonderful guy, he, uh, he says, hey, what you want? I says, well, I'd like to have a hamburger and a vanilla malt. And I says, hey, I could take care of that. So a guy had been walking out when I walked in, and unbeknownst to me, the guy had left behind a little something underneath the counter. You know how you got the little footrest? Right. And on the footrest was a nice, not huge, just a decent-sized world-class radio, whatever it is, oh, wow. you know, where you got all the different uh, shortwave and AM, FM. It was pretty fancy stuff back then. We're talking, uh, what, about uh, uh, probably 63, you know, so it was pretty fancy for 63. So I'm looking, I'm spying this thing down there, and Mr. Eddie's getting ready, and he's got to go in the back now, and I know his routine. He's got to go get the patty in the walk-in fridge. Right. Then he slaps it on the grill and gets going. Well, I waited, I mean, and my heart's... And he, oops, sorry, Mike. <laughs> anyway, long story short, he goes into the uh, walk-in, and that's it. I seized the moment, grabbed that radio. I put it in the half-filled bag of groceries and put the lettuce on the top oh and everything else. And there it is. Now now I'm like, and you know, you know, when you're a guilty kid, I mean, remember, mortal sin, you're going to go to hell. This and you're the most honest, per you yeah. are the most honest person well, I know, well, and that's helps. the truth. <laughs> So here I am in this, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a calamity inside, going on inside of me. Out comes Mr. Reddy and uh, the hamburger's ready and, uh, you know, everything. He says, you all right, boy? I said, well, I'm just not feeling very well. <laughs> I thought I was going to pass out, man. Oh, man. He says, well, maybe you should be eating a hamburger. You want to take it home? Well, I'll try to eat it. <laughs> oh God! I mean, my voice went up like three octaves, and I already sounded like Beaver Cleaver, man. You know, so I mean, it's just like. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I, I kind of went through half of the hamburger. I ended up taking the other half home. He puts it in the bag inside my bag. I'm thinking, oh God, oh, he's going to see, see the radio. <laughs> he didn't see the radio. He just put it in. And all right, thank you, Mr. Eddie. And I paid him the dollar eighty-five or whatever it was for the whole schmear, you know. So now I'm walking down, uh, and I, I and I and I cut across the street to my apartment building and uh, and I'm so happy that I got this radio and it's like and the doors open because we didn't like the doors in those days and I waltz right in and put the groceries on the shelf and my mom is right there and I go oh no chance to get rid of this radio <laughs> so now this radio is sitting inside of a bag and, and I know your mom uh oh <laughs> Like, uh, uh, and now she starts taking, oh, you didn't finish a hamburger. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm, I wasn't feeling well. And now I'm really not feeling, I'm going to pass out, man, right. you know. So she takes out the letters and she takes it and she goes, what's this? Frankie, what's this? <laughs> and now you know she's got you. You know, and the story, I mean, I'm almost saying the story word for word. She's got me, man. And now I turn into a white sheet. I am just about, I'm, I'm fluttering. Right. I'm ready to go, ready. I'm, I know I'm going to die. She's right. going to kill me. So she goes, where did you get this? I says, well, you know that transistor radio dad gave me for Christmas? I traded Billy my radio for this radio. She says, what? <laughs> Immediately <laughs> grabs me by the ear and says, now you're going to take me right now to where you got that. And here we go. <laughs> So she closes the apartment door, locks it up. We walk down the one flight. And now, of course, of all the times in my life, every kid, every friend, everybody I ever knew, every adult, everybody who knows us all, it happens to be outside the darn building. Of course. You know? It's like, whoa, and they're watching me. <laughs> I'm bawling. I mean, the snot's coming out. I mean, I'm done. I'm done. I'm going to die. I don't care who sees what's going on. Right. So <laughs> she's dragging me all the way up Amsterdam Avenue. I mean, it's just a half a street and across the street. And right. here we go into the campus restaurant. 
and who's, who's, as we're approaching the campus restaurant, there's a huge guy out there. I didn't realize at the time. Yes. This guy was like 6'6". Six, six, oh, my God. 240. He looked like George Foreman. Right. I mean, this guy was, and he's yelling at me, you took that radio. He says, I don't know what you're talking about. You, I'm going to kick your butt. And I'm like, oh, God, he's going to kill me, this guy. Because here comes my mom with the radio on one hand and my ear in the other. It's like... And now they both turn around at the same time, you know. You got, you got a picture. It's like slow motion. I see it coming. Here it comes. Here it comes. Here it comes. This guy's just going to choke me out. I go like this. He's going to kill me. And all of a sudden, I hear them both laughing. Right. They stop the argument. And the guy goes, oh, man. And then he says, you know, sorry, Mr. Eddie. I see what the problem is. I think this young fellow needs a lesson. And I go, Please don't kill me. Please don't hit my mother's leg. <laughs> She's thinking it's going to happen too. Yeah. And the guy just says, you know what, boy? I think you just learned your lesson. Well, I, think, I think we don't need to go any further with this. You're not going to do this again, are you? And I said, no, no, sir. And I, I, mean, I don't know what was sticking out of what at that point, but uh, you know, it, it, it all worked out. But that was the That's genesis a... of my writing career, writing that one experience oh, wow. with that sort of intensity is what captured this uh, instructor's um, imagination. He says, you know, boy, you, you better do something with this. Right. And yet, you know, because of other things I was involved with, especially music and uh, trying to learn about ladies and everything right. else uh, and forgetting all about school. Everyone got sidetracked yeah, in yeah, the 70s. Yeah, it was definitely a sidetrack. Yeah, yeah then uh, the writing just went by the wayside, so I concentrated on the percussion and singing and stuff like that. Right, but that's a, that's a wonder. I never, this is the first, I've, I've known you for all these years, this is the first time I heard that. Yeah, I never shared that story, because it, it's, it's embarrassing, it's, it's well, shameful. Now, just, just now you shared it with the world, but that's okay, <laughs> whether it's embarrassing or not. No, but, but I did tap you on the shoulder uh, for another project, and you know, maybe a little later we'll get into more of it, but uh, you know, uh, since I started getting back into showbiz and stuff, uh, I wanted to, I was thinking of a way that you and I could work together because of our friendship and because uh, not just because of our friendship but because you are a creative person and yeah, we always yeah. talked about that yeah. in the past yeah. yep. and uh, you actually have written a screenplay based on uh, on basically 10 days that happened in uh, June of t 1969 mm -hmm. and uh, it's called the uh, right now the working title was the laundry man right. and uh, so, I mean, you want to talk about that process a little bit? Uh, I could certainly do that. I, uh, I, first of all, I have to say that, um, you know, thank you indeed. Let's, let's rewind back to the lesson, you know. Oh, sorry. That was the <laughs> last time I wrote anything. Right. So, mm -hmm. I'm thinking, okay, now you're tapping me for this project, which is a huge honor in light of uh, seeing all the stuff you've been doing. Right. And I'm thinking, man, I mean, am I up to this? But then I think to myself, well, we know each other as well as we do. I mean, uh, I mean, if he feels I'm up to it, I'm not going to let him down. I'm going right. to do this one way or the other. Right. And uh, so I got started, and the only way to get started is to do it right now. And that very night I started. So, and uh, you know my dad, right? and I know Max. I mean, what as long as I've known you right. and uh, your your mom, you know, right. at, at the and time, my sister know, and, and my brother, and David, and, yes. Yeah. I mean, and my cousins. And my yeah, <laughs> in fact, in fact, I had a uh, a passing fancy with your cousin there, right. you know, for a time, and uh, and because of this thing called honor, right. you know, and and whatnot, I wouldn't dare, you know, proceed, you know. So, you know, yeah, for what it's worth, but she is definitely a great girl. Yeah, she is. She's pretty cool. Huh. And uh, she's going through a rough spot, but yeah. she's going to be okay. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and life is good, you know. And actually, that's, uh, I mean, I don't mind sharing that, that the working title is The Laundry Man. Yes. But, but you suggested, and I think it's an excellent idea, that uh, we're going to call the movie uh, Life is Good. And LMC TV, I mean, they're still waiting for us to start the project, but they, we actually signed uh, with LMC TV mm -hmm. to produce the film. So... Uh, that I, I was so happy to do it. I know we haven't started yet, but at least we have the script. The whole thing is, the, the, the problem with making it really good, I think, is that it's a period piece. Yes. So in order for it to really work, either we have to update it, which won't work, mm -hmm. to modern times. It won't, work, it won't be as poignant because of the special times that were the 60s and you know, the stories about my father getting shot, which we've discussed many times on the show. Mm -hmm and just the way the world was in the late 60s in terms of race relationships in New York City and 
and just uh, well, even the vernacular of the time. Right, I the mean, uh, it was all a, different. A lot time. of uh, language and everything has changed throughout the years. But, right. Uh, it, it it was it, this movie can't be. I don't want it to be uh, politically correct. I mm -hmm. want it to be more representative, of which you've done. Yeah. More representative of the time and the word. I mean, and you've even added a certain. You you've taken it and enhanced it in a way that I didn't foresee it going the story, even though I know the story well because uh, <laughs> you lived it. I, I lived it. <laughs> but the idea that the, you know that and you know people might say luck, some people might say divine intervention, whatever whatever the situation is. Uh, what happened to my father is, I mean, he's a hundred years old now. He's doing well. And he he should have been dead. Mm -hmm. So some sort of intervention happened. Whether it was the you know we can't just say it's all the doctors because they screwed up his blood type. You know yeah. they did all. I mean, wow. steps <laughs> different steps happened along the way. That, I mean, he could have died so many different times during that whole right. situation. And then you yeah. also think you know he's a World War II veteran. How many times could have he died then? Mm -hmm. You know, and he you know he was born in 1915. What was the mortality rate then? I mean, so the, yeah. the, there's a lot of things that make him a lucky guy. You know, and um, and I think, well, I, I know that uh, I, well, I want I want this movie to be made, and I want him to go to the premiere. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, that's that's that was the the hope was that we'd do it by the time he turned 100. I missed that one, but mm. uh, I'd like to do it before he turns 101. That's something that I I think that I'm going to be uh, focusing on. Certainly, at least get it started this year. Right. You know, so. Uh. That's, uh, that was the plan that you uh, laid yeah, out. I wanted so, to, yeah. and I really want to get it done. Uh, I, I know that there's at least one camera person I know of, and it's probably Matt, who's going to be able to uh, <laughs> to join the party with that, because uh, I know, you know, uh, his commitment to to my father, you know. Yeah. And um, but this whole, the one thing about LMC TV, it changed my life. You know, I mean, look at this. I mean, what's I mean? It, it's also is this. Is this just a coincidence that you're in town right now that I'm shooting today? I mean, you're, you're here for a weekend, and it just, I mean, maybe it's coincidence, maybe it's something else, too. You know, you never well, know. it's certainly appreciated, that's for sure. Thank you for the invite. So. Well, it's fun. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it can't be better. So uh, how's the rest of the family? Well, everybody's doing well. You know, I mean, back in sunny Arizona, you know, yeah. things are, uh, funny enough, um, the temperature in Arizona um, yesterday and uh, here in New York was the same. Wow. In the 60s for a good part of the day. And it's been beautiful the 70s, last couple of, you know. yeah, It's been nice. It's know? not too shabby for this time of year. Usually it's about mid 80s by this time in Phoenix. And it's been so, I mean, it's been crazy. The, the temperature in New York in the, the last couple of months, I mean, it's been like yeah, cold. Hot, 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 you know, yeah, it's been like it's weird. crazy stuff. But. Uh, it's, I'm happy. I'm just happy the way things fell into place today. Yeah. I'm happy yeah. that your son Ian was able to uh, to watch this. We don't usually have an audience, but Ian's in the background over there. And that's nice to see. <laughs> yeah. Nice Indeed. to see him over there. And uh, I really wanted you to get a chance to see the studio that you're going to be working with when we do <laughs> when yeah. we, when, the, when the movie actually gets off the ground. Okay. I'm hoping. That I'm, I'm going to. Uh, yeah, I'm going to probably play Max. That's that's the hope. But we still and. Mm -hmm. That's it. I'm probably going to wind up using JT, who is my ca uh, casting director, to cast the show. But, and, uh, and of course, uh, it would be great, I think, if we can possibly use Max himself to narrate certain. Well, that's certain yeah. No, that's of, the story. Uh, that's the story that you put together, and yeah, you yeah, know, so that, you uh, have a voice in this as much as me because we're co-executive producers of the show. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so he can be an off-camera voice or what have you. You know, right. even in, in but I was thinking people, also, you know. The other thing is, even though my fa my grandfather passed away, I was hoping maybe he could play Louis Bendich, who was my grandfather, his yeah, father. Yeah. But on uh, camera, yeah, certainly. yeah, on camera, so he could do both. But, yeah, uh, yeah, wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. Do like an Eddie Murphy, where you play five different roles. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I wonder how I'm going to be able to deal with the realities of, of, of the reality of the of the show. You know, the the, the actual story and reliving those times because it was a it was a crazy time and. Uh, and it's, you know. Yeah, I mean, there'll never be another period like that. They, the entire world, especially this country, was in, the, in a complete upheaval, social upheaval. Right. 
uh, the sexual revolution was in full swing. And right. I mean, attitudes and mores and morals were just falling by the wayside. So right. it was kind of like, I mean, what's his name, the uh, the LSD guy? I mean, if it, feels good, yeah. you go, if it feels good, do it, you know, and people were doing it, you know, so. It's funny, I was working at the Hollywood Palace yes. and my bar back's name was Tim. Oh no. So I screamed out, hey Tim, get me to, you know, pass the bottle. And Timothy Leary was there back oh, in 1981. God. He said, are you talking to me? I said, no, 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 I'm talking to my bar back, you know. That actually happened. That's hilarious. I mean, the people man. that used to come to that club were, I mean, it was crazy, but. Uh, it's a uh, who's who, a virtual who's who of uh, the um, entire room. Right. I mean, Gary Hart, when he announced that he was going to become president, of, you know, they were running for the presidency. Yes. He did it from the Hollywood Palace. I mean, all these, uh, the people that, yeah, you know, but that's a separate. I wish you would come visit me in Hollywood. I wish. Yeah, yeah I was so dumb. I mean, that, well, that, then again, I had other pressing issues. Yeah, I mean, right. You had your life to live, yeah, and uh, yeah. but it's 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 amazing the the journeys that both of us have taken from Co-op uh, City. I almost said it with an S H, but <laughs> Co-op City, to 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 this moment in the Marinek at LMC TV. You know, yeah. what I mean, to me, it's and it's not over yet, but mm -hmm. it's uh, and in certain ways, I look at it as only beginning. You know, because, uh, you know, even if, if I retire from my real job, I can't see myself retiring from, from doing this kind of stuff or mm -hmm. doing, you know, scrapless or doing well, uh, yeah, the, the I've, movies. I've, I've you seen know. you, man. You know, you, you've definitely gotten it. It's like a whole new life, a whole new wind getting back into right. uh, Cause it acting. Because I was know. like, for yeah. a while there, I was, sure. I was pretty low on energy. It was like me with my uh, seat, the, the uh, lesson, you know, lying fallow, but then you bounce right back and yeah, I notice all the stuff you've done with LMC, you know, has uh, really, you I know. know. I mean, even I, I, could, I feel like I have this energy, and even my father's that way too. You know, I mean, my father could be, uh, you know, having a rough time, or whatever. But as soon as he sits in that chair that you're sitting mm -hmm, in, mm -hmm. he just, it just like, you know, he just like in full blossom. But you know, yeah. the, the bad th part about these shows is that every now and then, you know, we wind up having just uh, one last thing to say. But mm. you know what? We're, we're going to have another show. I guarantee it. Sounds okay? great. But there's one last thing to say, sir. That's a wrap. Good night, folks. Thank you.